Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Andy Kaufman. Um, I've been uh, talking a lot lately about this uh, viral pandemic, and um, I've learned some things lately that have helped me uh, develop a, a theory, and I think I know what is really going on here, so I want to give that information to everyone. Um, I want everyone to know that I, I am a qualified uh, medical doctor, um, so I put up some information about my background here. Um, I'm board certified. I practice in psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. Um, I also do natural healing consultation. Um, in the past, I've worked in hematology and oncology. I've held leadership positions in uh, medical school. I ran a uh, medical device startup company. Um, and you can see where I had my education. So I feel that I am uh, qualified to talk about this subject matter, and I hope you'll agree. I just want to uh, thank uh, some people out there who have been really instrumental and inspiring to me. So first of all, uh, Dr. Cowan, who has uh, been outspoken as well on this issue, and he really inspired me and gave me some great ideas that helped me put this whole big picture together. Uh, I want to uh, especially thank James True, who has been a, a great friend, uh, confidant, and collaborator uh, throughout this whole thing. And uh, we're definitely going to do a lot more work together down the road. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Richie from Boston, uh, Jason Lindgren, and, and Crow777 uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, get my message out there and for being so supportive um, and open. Uh, it's uh, really uh, just been incredible that I've been able to, uh, to uh, pursue this uh, mission. I want to thank my, uh, my kids who uh, have been ignored a lot lately since I've been working so hard trying to figure things out. Um, and I'm so proud of them. They're the uh, only children in my area who I know who are not uh, afraid of getting sick and they're out playing and having a good time. And then lastly, uh, Dr. Lanka and Dr. Turner Banks, who have done just amazing research and scholarship and have written uh, books and papers that have really uh, helped me figure things out. So thank you to everyone. All right, let's jump right in. So I want to start at the beginning at Ground Zero, Wuhan, China, Hubei province. This is the seafood market there. It's an open air market uh, where the first cases occurred. And as you can see from this uh, picture, um, there's a bunch of meat and, and animal carcasses uh, just laid out right on the ground. Um, here's another photograph from the market uh, where you can see that uh, conditions are some, somewhat less than sanitary. You have uh, live animals, you have dead animals, you have uh, cut up body parts and fluids that all seem to be cross-contaminating. So this is uh, definitely uh, not the kind of market where I'd be wanting to buy uh, my food from but certainly there was a lot of traffic there, uh, a very big market. So if uh, what we had is a situation where just about 200 people at first uh, became ill with a mysterious um, pneumonia type illness at this seafood market, and many of the people were uh, actually employed or made their livelihood at the market. So I wanna ask uh, the audience out there, if you uh, learned about this information, what would be your first thought about what most likely might be the problem that caused this mysterious illness? So would it be A, a new genetic disease like cystic fibrosis? Would it be B, a new virus, a new viral illness? Would it be C, autoimmune disease where the body is attacking itself causing the problem? Or would it simply be bad seafood? And I think most of you would agree that the first thought you'd have, given the commonality of the market and the sanitary conditions there, is that bad seafood would be an issue and something certainly to look into. However, the scientists in China did not agree. And in fact, they did not look into this issue at all, as far as I can tell. But instead, they jumped right into the possibility of a virus. So this is a quote from the first paper from the uh, the group there that uh, claims to have identified uh, this uh, new coronavirus. And what they said is, the disease was determined as viral induced pneumonia by clinicians according to clinical symptoms, um, including basically a fever, uh, low white blood cell count. Uh, pulmonary, pulmonary infiltrates just means uh, fluid and congestion in the lungs on a chest x-ray. And the people did not get better after three days of antibiotics. So they, they did think of, of a bacterial infection first and then went right to the virus. And they note that most of the early cases had contact with the seafood market. 
So it sounds like they, they were primed to blame a virus on this, on this uh, illness right away. So how did they actually um, uh, claim to have proved that a virus call, caused this illness? So what they did is they, they took seven, only seven out of, the, out of the almost 200 initial patients who were sick, and they uh, stuck uh, basically a fiber optic camera, like a long tube down their windpipe into their lungs, and then they squirted a bunch of fluid in there um, and mixed it around, and it, it collected whatever debris or cells or uh, chemicals were, were in the lungs, and then they sucked it back up. And they did take some other body fluids. They did take blood. They took oral swabs and nasal swabs, but, but is the lung fluid where they really uh, found what they, or think they found what they were looking for. So when they took this lung fluid out, they did not first try to find a virus in there and separate it out and purify it. But the first thing they did was find and separate some kind of genetic material. Quite an interesting strategy. And what they found was some RNA. But I'll tell you that in our bodies, uh, at any given time, there is some free genetic material circulating around our blood and body fluids. And in addition to that, there are genetic material contained in various types of structures. So um, our, there's uh, various types of vesicles, essentially just small little sacks of fluids that sometimes contain genetic material. There's also the normal bacteria that live in our body, including in the lungs, and they have genetic material. So there are quite a number of different sources of genetic material. So when they found this genetic material from the lung fluid, they then uh, determined the sequence of it, which is basically the code of the genetic material. Um, so they determined uh, all of the base pairs and the order of that sequence. And then they rushed to rapidly develop a diagnostic test, which is a, a qualitative PCR, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. So in other words, before they really proved anything, they already developed a test, okay? So why didn't they purify the virus and how do they know what the source is of that genetic material? So it turns out that I um, was looking in a, a related area and I found this study from last summer. And this study was trying to also develop a, a diagnostic test, but for lung cancer. And essentially, they used the same exact procedure. So they got the lung fluid in the same way with that bronchoalveolar lavage, and they collected that fluid, and out of that fluid, they isolated genetic material, and they sequenced that and uh, tried to, they called it a possible biomarker, and this could be a test for lung cancer. So I thought it was, uh, it was quite interesting and coincidental that the same exact procedure was developing a diagnostic test for lung cancer as was developing a diagnostic test for this pandemic pneumonia. So let's look uh, a little bit more in detail at this test. So this is a, uh, that RT-PCR stands for, it's a mouthful, but it's reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And the RT part refers to that we're using it to to amplify RNA rather than DNA. If we were using it to amplify DNA, it would just be called PCR. Okay, now I'll tell you some important things about this test. So the most important thing is it's not actually testing for the virus itself, it's testing for a sequence of RNA. Now that sequence of RNA may be present in a virus, but it also may be present in other things. And so I'll give you an example, and I think I mentioned this before, but let's say we had a person that we wanted to identify. Okay, so James, I'm gonna use you this time. So we wanna, we wanna be able to identify James out of a crowd, and we're gonna send him to a Yankee Stadium to a baseball game. And, but we're not gonna use, we're not gonna look for James's face or any other part of his actual body. Instead, we're gonna use uh, a surrogate marker just like they're using for this test. So we're gonna put a, a cap on James's head. And now we're not gonna use the typical navy blue Yankees hat because there are gonna be a million people with that, right? So we got uh, a unique Yankees hat with pinstripes on it. So it's white with blue pinstripes. And we're gonna have him put that hat on and then go into the stadium and disperse amongst the crowd. And then we have a team of 10 people that we're gonna send out into the stadium looking for that hat. Okay, so we do this procedure. And lo and behold, what happens is we actually find six of these hats. 
Okay, so six out of uh, 10 people find someone wearing this hat. So we go and identify if any of those people are James. And it actually turns out that none of them are James because James doesn't like wearing hats. So once he got in the stadium, he gave his hat to, uh, to some kid who would have liked it. And that was one of the six people that we found. So you see that when you, when you um, are looking for something that's not exactly the thing you're looking for, but it's something that's associated with that thing, you have to really understand the relationship between what you're looking for and that thing. So in other words, we had to ask James, James, will you, will you be comfortable wearing this hat the whole time, right? And then we also have to know, did other people um, buy this hat or is this a one-of-a-kind hat, right? So you can see it can be very misleading. We can get a lot of false results um, by using this type of method. So in order to mitigate that, and by the way, this concept was just drilled into us in medical school that whenever you're evaluating a new test, that you need to compare it to the gold standard. And that's how you know if it's actually valid. So with this COVID-19 test, there has not been any gold standard test that this has been compared to because the uh, supposed COVID-19 virus has never been purified um, and visualized. So in other words, if we were able to take people who are ill with this um, pandemic pneumonia, and take their lung fluid and from that purify out a virus particle that we could identify. And once we purified that, we could actually take the genetic material right from that particle. So we know that it came where it came from. We know it didn't come from anywhere else because now we have a pure sample of only these particles. Then we would be able to have a gold standard. And so the way you would test this PCR is you would have a group of sick patients, and then you would have a control group of healthy patients. You would perform the gold standard test so you'd be able to identify the virus out of each of those patients. And then you would compare the results of the PCR test to that gold standard. And that is really critical because it would allow you to, to determine or calculate an error rate because no test is perfect. It's also very, very important that you have that control group because that control group would not have the virus present at all and would also should have a negative PCR test. Um, and that's very important in order to help you calculate these error rates. So one example of a type of error that I think we'd be very concerned about with this test because we don't want to be mislabeled as being positive for this alleged virus and then risk being quarantined or perhaps even detained. So, um, we, so we want to know the accuracy. Now, there was a paper that came out um, where they, they had to estimate the false positive rate because you can't calculate it since there's no gold standard to compare it against. And they actually reported an estimated rate of 80% um, in people without symptoms. So what that means is if you got tested, let's say you were uh, exposed to somebody who tested positive uh, or you traveled or something like that and you want to get tested or you're, you're asked to get tested, there would be four out of five times that there was a positive result, there would actually be no illness. So this could be a real, real big problem. It certainly could vastly overestimate the number of cases and also could have a lot of consequences uh, for you based on this quarantine situation. So just to talk generally about what the PCR test, because there's actually additional error even beyond what I've described. So what this test does is it's really just an amplification strategy. And the reason this is necessary is because we're, we're kind of looking for a needle in the haystack. We might only find a few copies of this genetic material. And if there's only a few copies, we just can't detect it out of all of the other stuff that's in the fluid. So, so what this does is it's uh, a reaction that actually um, uh, replicates the strand of RNA uh, and it makes uh, a copy. So it makes from one to two. So you would run a cycle of this reaction and you'd go from say one copy to two copies. Then you would stop the reaction and then start another cycle by adding some more materials. And then you go from two to four and repeat it again, four to eight and so on and so on. And this is an exponential or a binomial expansion. And if you look at the uh, black uh, curve on the graph here, you'll see that's what that represents. 
So um, generally speaking, when you're using this test, you want to carry out approximately between 25 and 35 cycles in order to get enough amplification, amplification that you can see what you're looking for. If you go too much beyond that, what happens is you end up amplifying the noise. So it seems to be generally represented that the absolute maximum number of cycles that you could do and still get an accurate result is 45. And that's exactly the number of cycles that is recommended for this COVID-19 PCR test. So it's right at the upper limit. And I'm gonna share this quote with you uh, from another article about PCR. It says, what PCR does is to select a genetic sequence and then amplify it enormously. It can accomplish the equivalent of finding a needle in a haystack. It can amplify that needle into a haystack. Like an electronically amplified antenna, PCR greatly amplifies the signal, but also greatly amplifies the noise. Since the amplification is exponential, the slightest error in measurement, the slightest contamination, can result in errors of many orders of magnitude. So this is not a very accurate test, especially when you're pushing the number of cycles to get so much amplification. Uh, just a slight mistake can result in false positives. And I think that's, that's what we've been seeing. So I'm going to change gears now a little bit and talk about something different, something that most of you have never heard of whatsoever, and it's called exosomes. And I'm going to talk about what they are and why they're relevant for this discussion. So exosomes are something that is naturally occurring in the body. Um, so I have this diagram here. And if you look at the top right of the diagram, you'll see that this is a normal cell here outlined. And inside the cell, you have these vesicles. And inside of our cells, there are a number of different little organs. They call them organelles. And they're generally contained by a membrane. They come in different shapes but lots of them are in this structure. It's essentially like a spherical blob that has the same membrane as is the outer membrane of the cell, a lipid bilayer membrane, and it can contain various types of chemicals. Now, this is a specific type of uh, vesicle that um, will end up merging with the cell membrane at the surface under certain conditions and release these exosomes out into the extracellular fluid and they'll get into the circulation and be distributed around the body. So while they're inside the cell, they're called MVEs, which stands for multivesicular endosomes. So in other words, they have a bunch of exosomes or vesicles inside them. And they, they release these on a regular basis just day to day. And there are many things though that can induce this process and accelerate it and increase the number of exosomes that it releases outside of the cell. And so these exosomes uh, leave the cell and you see they have these little squares on them. And these little squares are like a lock. And what they do is they go around the body through the circulation and they're looking for the right um, key to fit their lock. And that's called the target cell. And depending on what kind of cell releases them, they might have different keys and different locks, so they're targeted to different parts of the body. And these are, are mostly thought to involve communication. So communication between one cell and another cell, between one part of the body and another part of the body. And they can have many functions in this communication, which I'll, I'll get to momentarily. So here on the left, uh, this is an electron uh, micrograph or a picture from an electron microscope of exosomes. And you can see here an exosome budding out of the cell. And it's essentially a, a spherical or circular, this is a cross section, so this is like a, a slice of the tissue. Um, where on the, on the periphery, there are like these kind of globular densities or little, little dots or circles, right? And inside the cell here where it says MVP, MVB, sorry, these are the same as MVEs, uh, that's where all these exosomes are when they're inside the cell before they butt out, okay? And now we have a picture on the right, which allegedly shows this COVID-19 virus. And you can see that there are these vesicles budding out of the cell in a circular shape with these globular uh, dots on the periphery. So essentially it's the same thing. Now you might think that this looks a little bit fuzzier on the exosomes and it looks a bit sharper 
in this picture. And I want to tell you that the reason for that is because when you're cutting these thin sections of tissue to make these slides, you're using this device called a microtome. It's like a vibrating razor blade. And it's technically difficult. And sometimes the tissue doesn't cooperate well, or sometimes the person is less skilled and you might not have a perfect slice. On this COVID-19 slide, this is, uh, I've not seen a better slice than this, it's absolutely perfect. The one on the left is a little bit thicker, and so that's why it looks a bit fuzzier and less sharp, but essentially you're seeing the same exact thing. And I wanna uh, take a look at the same comparison when we see both of them inside of, of the host cell. Okay, so on the bottom left here, this is a COVID-19 cell. And you see right here is supposedly this is the virus particle inside the cell. And once again, you see a circular shape. And inside, you see these round globular um, aggregates. Okay, now look at the top right. And this here is showing you two, uh, this is less magnification. And this is actually a nerve cell. Um, and this is the MVE. So these are a bunch of exosomes inside here. And you see a circular structure filled with these globular um, uh, particles. So once again, same thing, also same size, um, both about 500 nanometers in diameter. Okay, you see the scale lines here, so you can see for yourself. So now we have a series of two comparison photographs under electron microscope of the virus and an exosome outside the cell, and a virus and an MVE inside the cell, and you can see that they are identical in appearance. So let's look at actually some physical parameters of these and make uh, continue our comparison. So we've kind of, I've mentioned a little bit that they are roughly the same size when they're inside the cell, same size when they're outside the cell. Now there is some variability here. I've looked at lots of these photographs and um, I see in both cases, there is some variability in the size. So these numbers are not precise, but in every case, they are essentially compatible in their range of sizes. Now also the receptor, now this is a key, key thing. Now remember I mentioned that lock and key mechanism. Well, actually with the COVID-19 uh, um, papers, they have discovered that on its surface, it has a receptor for ACE2. Now ACE2 is uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. It's an enzyme in our bodies. One of its functions is that it, it works with the kidney to regulate blood pressure, and there are blood pressure medications that inhibit this enzyme. But in this paper, what they said is that this receptor is actually how the virus invades the cells. Now, I also was able to find a paper where they've identified exosomes coming from our own body that also use the ACE2 receptor as their lock and key mechanism to find their target cells. So exosomes and COVID-19, the same exact receptor on their surface targeting the same exact cells. Now these both contain genetic material and it's both in the form of RNA, no DNA, only RNA. And these structures are both found in the lung fluid. So the lung cancer test that I showed you earlier found exosomes in that fluid, and uh, the lung fluid showed the COVID-19 as well. So you can see that the more we, we take out this comparison forward, we see that they're essentially the same in every important way. So I happen to, um, uh, be looking in the virology literature, and actually they also think exosomes and viruses are uh, possibly the same thing. So this is James, Dr. James Hildreth, a very prominent uh, researcher and academic physician in the field of virology and HIV research. He's currently the president and CEO of Mahari Medical College, but he was a full professor at Johns Hopkins, and he wrote this paper with two of his colleagues there. And what he said, and I quote, the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. 
Now, this was just a great confirmation for what I was already thinking, and I was kind of blown away when I read this in the paper because uh, this was one of the last papers I looked at um, to find this after I had already come to the same conclusion. It really helped validate my opinion. So what is it that causes us to make more of these exosomes and throw them out into our circulation? So it turns out that almost every type of insult to the body would, would actually cause this, pro this process to occur. So toxic substances, and I found several papers looking at this. Some of them looked at um, environmental toxins, uh, such as heavy metals like arsenic, um, and organic uh, chemical toxins. Uh, also found uh, evidence about bacterial toxins, and I have a slide that I'll show you in a minute. So there's clearly has a role in um, e communication or possibly removal of toxic substances that damage our cells. Now, interestingly, psychological stress, including fear, which many, many people around the world are experiencing in a very intense way right now, also causes release of exosomes. So you see how this may uh, cause false positive tests. Cancer, as I mentioned before, um, lung cancer uh, uh, has many exosomes. Um, ionizing radiation, infection, injury, in fact, any type of immune response, so whether it be to injury, infection, or another disease. Um, asthma. Now, many papers just said that exosomes are in, in, induced by disease, and they didn't mention anything specific, and they seem to be implying that virtually any type of disease can cause this process. Now, I really wanted to find evidence that EMF would induce exosomes, but unfortunately, I could not find a paper on this. But I want to say to all of the people in this field of research on exosomes that this would be an excellent contribution to the literature if you were to look at this issue, if various, especially microwave radiation like 5G, would cause this as well. So I want to talk about the second paper because this is gonna help us merge these two ideas of a virus and an exosome, and are they the same thing? So this is uh, also from the group in China. Um, this one is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they had a slightly different uh, protocol, but essentially it was very similar. So what they did is, once again, they, they did that procedure to get the lung fluid, um, and then they centrifuged it and just took the fluid, so any cells, um, from the host, uh, like any lung cells that might be in there or bacterial cells would, would be stuck in a pellet in the bottom of the test tube, and they just took the fluid off the top, assuming that if there were viral particles, they'd be in that fluid. But they didn't actually then try to purify the virus out of that fluid. Instead, they mixed it with, with cells that they took from a, a, a person who had lung cancer surgery and they incubated it with the lung cancer cells. Now you remember, I said earlier, and I showed experimental evidence that lung cancer cells make exosomes. So when they then purified particles after incubating this fluid with the lung cancer cells and then examined them under the microscope, well, were they looking at viral particles or were they looking at exosomes? And I have two images below, and one is supposedly the viral particle from this paper, and the other is an exosome. Can you tell the difference? Here is um, another uh, slide showing the functions of exosomes as they can remove toxins. So in the upper right here, these uh, green cells are actually bacteria. And by the way, this image, all electron micrograph images are always in black and white. If you see an image like this, this has been colorized after the fact, and they did that to help you identify what is what. So I, I think this is actually quite a nice approach, and this is a real slide. It's very different from some of the slides that, that you've seen that are just computer graphics that are made by an artist. So these particles that they colored purple are... Uh, the toxins uh, released by the bacteria, and uh, they, if they were allowed to contact the cell membrane, they would actually bore little holes in there, and the cell's contents would leak out and it would die. 
Um, so what's happening is that the cell put out these yellow exosomes once it, once it realized these toxins were there. And you see they're all budding out of the central area of the cell. And you can see they're basically swallowing up the little toxin particles. And so in this experiment, what they actually did is that they found that when they mixed cells with the bacteria, if the cells put out the exosomes that ate up the toxins, then the cell survived. If the cells were mixed with the bacteria and they did not put out the exosomes, then the cells died. So this was done you know, in a Petri dish, not in a person, but so we can't say for sure, but, but what this is really telling us is that these exosomes help us clear these toxins so that they don't damage our tissue. So a very important function. I also wanted to take a quick look because there have been some recent reports that people who have been ill are having rapid recoveries with a couple of uh, non-traditional treatments. Like these are not things that uh, would typically be thought of by the medical establishment to use for a quote unquote viral uh, illness. But there are certainly uh, reports, there was a doctor in New York City who claimed that he cured several hundred patients with hydroxychloroquine. I think he combined it with zinc. Now, hydroxychloroquine was originally a drug for malaria, um, but it's used in, in the United States uh, primarily for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And it is not known how it works uh, in those illnesses. And in my experience, it doesn't really work at all in those illnesses. However, there has been a bunch of research trying to figure out what this drug does. And I, I read a review paper on this and I found uh, quite an interesting thing. So there are studies that show that this drug can release lysosomal enzymes. So I'll tell you that the lysosome is the basically the garbage dump of the cell. So it's another one of these vesicles or sacs and it has all these enzymes that basically just chew everything up, you know, similar to what happens in your gut when you're digesting food. And any trash that is not working anymore, right, like proteins that have degraded or DNA that was copied in error or things like that, they get sent to the lysosome for destruction and recycling. So it breaks it down into the basic constituents and then is able to send it back to uh, the factory part of the cell where it could be reused to make new molecules. But in the case of this drug, what it actually does is release these enzymes out of the compartment in the cell and into the cell cytoplasm. And this can actually be quite damaging to the cell itself. However, if the cell has been inundated with some kind of toxic substance, these enzymes could help break that down so that the cell could survive. So I, I think that may be actually how it's helping uh, these patients. Now, vitamin C is the, the other one that has been reported to be quite successful. And a lot of people think that vitamin C really works by, you know, quote unquote, boosting the immune system. Now, it does have an effect on some of the immune regulatory function, but I do not feel that that's really how it helps in these conditions. In my opinion, it is the antioxidant properties of this drug um, and possibly the blood thinning quality qualities that is what really helps this illness. So when you have a, a toxic exposure, oftentimes that toxin will cause what's known as oxidative stress or free radicals. And we're all familiar with, you know, that it's recommended to take antioxidants and, you know, eat special kinds of berries and things like that. But nobody really, not too many people understand what that's really doing. But what it, what it does is it kind of acts like a neutralizing sponge for these free radicals. It just soaks them up and quelches them. And what the free radicals do is they have like a chain reaction. It's like they tag someone and make them a free radical and tag the next person and make it a free radical. And then all these molecules end up falling apart and making a huge mess and the cells can't function. So the vitamin C stops that process dead in its tracks and reduces that damage um, and prevents further damage. And in my opinion, that's how it works for this type of acute illness. All right, so I'm gonna tie this all together, everything I've told you tonight into what I think is really going on here. So what I think is happening is that, first of all, 
as I've reported quite a bit, there are really not pandemic levels of people getting sick and dying from whatever's going on. The numbers are far less than a typical flu season. However, there clearly are some people who are getting sick. What I believe is causing this illness is that there is some kind of insult that occurs that causes the damage, and then there is a reaction to it, which is the production of exosomes. And when we are testing for this supposed virus, we are actually testing for these exosomes, which confirms that there's some kind of unhealthy process going on in the body. Now, I talked about the things that can cause production of the exosomes, and I believe that those represent the cause of the illness. And I think that the possibilities are that there is some kind of poison. Certainly, there's lots of precedent for a pneumonia-type illness coming from inhalation of toxic substances. There uh, could be the stress and fear could be the cause. It could represent a regular flu or pneumonia or even a bad cold and whatever causes those would be the same cause. And, and lastly, electromagnetic radiation could certainly be a cause as well. There has been a major proliferation and installation of new 5G infrastructure. And there's certainly evidence known that 5G can have adverse effects on one's health, including damaging DNA. And that, that evidence actually comes from Los Alamos National Laboratories when they've studied um, microwave and uh, radiation like they use in the body scanners in the airport. And I think it's quite possible that there is not one toxic exposure, but there could be different causes of this illness in different areas or perhaps even in the same area between different people that this may not be a uniform um, cause of the illness but it does cause a similar constellation of upper respiratory symptoms and these symptoms are not extremely specific all of these illnesses there are i could list off probably 20 different illnesses that would cause a cough possible shortness of breath a, a fever and suppress your white count. Um, so there could be several different causes of this, but I do not see any conclusive evidence whatsoever that there is any virus. And certainly you could see that the exosome and the virus are essentially indistinguishable from each other. So let me just reiterate that. So there is some sort of insult or toxin that you're exposed to, it causes illness, and then that stimulates your own cells to induce and produce and put out these exosomes because they will send the important signal to your body on how to handle this problem. And part of that is they will actually eat up and like a sponge soak up these toxins so that they can be safely removed from your body so that you can recover. So what I'm saying is that COVID-19 actually are exosomes and not a virus that invades your body from the outside. It comes from within your body to help you, and it's a reaction to the real cause of illness.